Let's just gather our lives here, huh? Let's take a breath, be present to this evening and the gift of this place and the hospitality of this parish and um, the gift of your life and faith and interest. Ever gracious and merciful God, we recognize the cross is our only hope and hope for those who have survived abuse and loneliness and fear. Help us recognize through the gift of art and expression and voice and conversation and story that we too belong to you, to the larger story of your dying and rising. Help us to, in this night, recall the beauty and the gift and the treasure of the talent of each person here, that we may proclaim your salvation in all that we do. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So what I'd like to do tonight um, is a few things, and, and I want to combine a few things. So we're certainly going to be looking at art and the story of the art. And one of the reasons why I want to tell the story of the art is that embedded in the story is the primary issue of what the stations are about. And that's the sexual abuse issues um, of the church and the clergy. Along with that, I want to talk about our faith and who we are in it and what we are called to be and to become in people who also recognize within our own hearts and lives the dying and rising of Jesus Christ. And in this Lenten season, we are all on this path of faith. We are all on this path toward the gift of eternal life. But embedded in the path are a lot of obstacles and a lot of misfortune and a lot of uncertainty, and a lot of trauma, and a lot of the things that we need to work through to understand the mystery about where we're going. So what I'd like to do tonight is touch on all of those things, because this is who we are, and this is who we are as a people of God and as the story of our salvation. Okay, before I go any further, there's Kathy. <laughs> Let's give Kathy a round of applause for putting all of this together. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I can't tell the story of these stations without first telling the story of my first coming to Sacred Heart uh, nine years ago in 2013. When I got here, um, Lisa Lundquist was working with our novices. So for those of you who don't know, I'm a member of the Congregation of Holy Cross and we have uh, a house of studies up in Cascade, it's called a novitiate. And so uh, our parish at Sacred Heart works, the novices work with us and we're, we're together a lot. Anyway, so when I got here, Lisa was teaching art with our novices. And that first year we had uh, a lot of them, we had 16 of them that year. And she came to me and said, you know, this class is too big. She goes, I need, 
I need more space. And I said, okay. I said, you know, I, I just got here, but, you know, I'll, I'll make it work, I said. You know, sounds like a new pastor, doesn't it? <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so I got space. But I said to her, I I'll give you space for, to have a little art class under only one condition. And she says, well, what's that? And I said, I want to do it too. Now, I have been involved in a lot of artistic things through the years, um, but I have never painted before. Not until I got here at Sa to Sacred Heart. So Lisa was kind of worried because you know, she thought maybe I would be disappointed if I didn't start the right way. So she had to think about it for a while. So then I remember very well, it was on a Friday, and she said, okay, she goes, I, I, I have it. She goes, I, I, I know how I want to start you. And so she took me into this room and she put two pieces of white paper on the wall. And uh, she had some black paint and a little container of water and a, black, and a brush. She said to me, okay, she said, I want you to tell me a story about somebody that you miss from your last place. Now, she knew that I was really grieving the place where I was because I worked with people who live outside, people with mental illness and addictions, and I really miss that. And I was having trouble making the transition to be a pastor again. And she says, okay, she says, I want you to tell me, tell me the story about one of those people, and I want you to describe that person. I said, okay. So Lisa picks up a brush she dips it in water and a little black paint, and she goes up to that first piece of paper, and she goes like this. And so Lisa looked at me, and she said, okay, she said, I want you to do it. I go, okay. So I describe had been received into the church where I was, he, too, had been abused as a child. He could not keep a job. He lived in a tent outside. And for the Easter vigil, you know, he came. I mean, he was Portland, right? So it's always raining. And he came to the Easter vigil absolutely soaking wet and stood in the center of that community and said, I want to belong. <laughs> So I picked up the brush, I dipped it in water, I dipped it in some black paint, and I went to the second piece of paper, and I went like that. And I stood back and looked at them and just bawled my eyes out. I just so missed that community. And Lisa just looked at me and she said, you know, she said, all of this is inside of you. You just have to do it. That was my painting lesson. So I kept going and she would, um, I, I, so I, I wound up, you know, in her class on Fridays and she, there were times that she would have to come to me and say, you know, she'd have to pull on my arm and get me to stop because I, I, I just, I, I would just lose myself in it. And, and, and I absolutely refused to have her tell me what color to use. I said, I'm too gosh darn old for you to tell me what color to use. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, that's how I started. Now, the interesting thing about the two people that I just portrayed, the, 
those two people um, had been abused as children. I wasn't really conscious of that when I told those stories to, to Lisa. So that brings me to, I'll jump to January of 2020, two months before the shutdown, right? It just so happened that we had this little storeroom uh, near our offices that I created uh, a studio after those years. And um, I had my studio all set. And um, I get this email from one of the editors at Liturgical Press, John Kyler. Now, it just so happened that John Kyler had been a novice of ours my first year there. So John knew about my art. And um, he said to me, you know, in, in this email, he said, we've got this project. Um, it's, on, um, it's on the Stations of the Cross. It's about... Um, the clergy's sexual abuse, and he said, I want you to think about illustrating them. And I emailed him back, and I said, no thanks. Because, one of the reasons why, I said, because I know what liturgical press prints. It's not what I do. And you'll be very disappointed if I do something. So we had a phone conversation, and then we had another phone conversation with his boss and John and myself. And then finally, um, John said this. Just get over yourself and do this. <laughs> I had a conversation with him today, and I said, now, do you, uh, do you say that to all of your authors? Um, he's, he said, no, no, he's, no. He said, sometimes he wants to, but no, no, he doesn't. So I said, okay, I'll do that. Now, here's another interesting thing. In the course of those few years when I was painting before this project, uh, very generous parishioners, um, maybe some who are here right now, through the course of the years, had given me uh, gift cards to Meiningers. And if you've ever been to Meiningers, which is the art store, it's really expensive. So what I just kind of, I just kind of held them, you know. I thought, well. Someday, you know, I'll have a project Well, I will need that. So, um, I, so I went to Moniger's and it was a snow day uh, in February. Now this was, you know, remember just a couple weeks before the shutdown. And um, it just so happened that what the, the, the supplies that I needed came almost exactly to the amount of the gift cards that had been given me. And, um, so it was like $400. And I said, wow, OK, this is the start. So I want to tell you about these stations. I began, after I got the supplies, I put everything away. I got a canvas out, and I got the paint together. And I thought, well, maybe I'll start something. So I knew I was going to take a week or so just to play. I wasn't going to, you know, what I was going to do was not going to be the thing. 
but I was just going to play. So here's what happened. It was the first day. I put the canvas on the stand, and I got some paint out, and I got water and a brush, and I started to paint. And I got about three quarters of the way through what I w you know, was thinking about the first image. And all of a sudden, I stopped. And I stared at it. And I absolutely bawled my eyes out because I realized that what I was doing with the art was trying to control it. And my heart absolutely stopped because I also realized that what the church has done for all these years with the issues of sexual abuse is tried to control it and to present an image that is different from the reality of the crime. I didn't know what to do. I felt I was in this new wilderness and I didn't know how to get out of it or where I was to go or how I was to proceed. So I stopped. I put everything away. And I just let it sit. Now this was in February, just a couple weeks before the shutdown. About a week later, I got another canvas out and I got some paints. And this time I just used my hands and a towel and whatever else I had. And I just started putting paint on a canvas. Just all kinds of colors. And just like I told Lisa, I didn't care what color I was going to put on there. I was going to do that myself. So I just put color on canvas. That's all I did. I just put paint on it. And I don't even know why I did that. Why would I do such a thing? I don't even know. But then I step back and I looked at it and I kept looking at it and I kept looking at it. And all of a sudden through all the shades and the color and the chaos of the canvas, the eyes of Jesus emerged. I recognized him. He, he, he was in the chaos. It was him. It was. So I, I just teased them out. And I thought, okay, let's just do this. And then I stopped. And I started to cry again. Because Jesus is in the chaos of all of these issues of abuse. And I realized at that moment that we cannot cover it up 
or whitewash it or wish it, it was something different or make it a different color. Or um, we, we have got to allow within the chaos the person of Jesus Christ to emerge because he is the source of what it is we are looking for in the first place. And that's the hope and healing of those who are suffering trauma and those who have been abused and those who are witnessing to the world that we believe in this in the first place. There in the center of that very first station were the eyes of Jesus. Now, had I ever encountered anything like that before? No, I had not. I had not. And then a couple of days later, the shutdown <laughs> happened. And all of a sudden, I found myself with all kinds of time <laughs> to be in my brand new studio to tease out of chaos uh, the eyes of Jesus Christ. This, um, my brothers and sisters, is a image of the first painting that, in fact, John took these uh, photos. Um, it is there, it was the original. And um, now, is this the image of Jesus that I would have painted had I started off trying to uh, continuing to control the images uh, for this project? Would that have been the image of Jesus I would have chosen? Absolutely not. But my sisters and brothers, this, this is the image. These are the eyes of Jesus Christ who came out of the chaos in this first Stations of the Cross. If you have not yet had an opportunity to read these and read uh, Father Paul Turner's text, text, it is really, really stunning. Some of it is very difficult. In fact, I'm sorry, I should have said at the beginning of this that if any of the things that we were going to be talking, to, talking tonight about uh, trigger you, um, please feel, you know, grab something to drink, take a walk outside, whatever you need to do, okay? I'm sorry I didn't say that at the beginning. So this first image um, started with um, the eyes uh, of Jesus. And um, if you look at the text, in fact, do you, do you guys have, you, everybody has a book? Okay. Let's just take a look at So this is obviously the place um, of Gethsemane right? And Jesus is saying to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. So as we look at this image, we are seeing the person of Jesus um, the night before uh, he dies. And we are also looking at those who were trying as well to stay awake. Right? So in this, in this image, we'll see the eyes of the disciples, um, but it's also then the eyes um, of the abuser. That is always in the shadow. That is always lurking. 
that is always part of the story, that is always part of the place in which Jesus is and we are, but there's also the trauma and the loneliness and the uncertainty and the crime. So in this, in this, first, ta in this first image, we see that um, the disciples and the abuser, those eyes can be anybody, right? They can be all of those things. Whoever eyes are behind the person of Jesus, trying to either stay awake or be out of the shadows or find their way, it's whoever it is. And one of the ways in which I was trying to, to look at this is that I was trying to get them, get us to see that, that in the chaos, that all of these things can speak differently depending on how it is we are looking at them, who we are, what our past has been, what our faith is about, how we believe in the process of Jesus' dying and rising in our lives in the first place. So the eyes here are all of those eyes. And so, again, I did not paint those eyes. Those eyes just emerged uh, in the chaos. We know, too, our place in it because, as the text says about... Um, about taking this, about Jesus saying, take this chalice from me, this, this suffering, this pain. So the chalice is there because guess what? Jesus isn't the only one who experiences the pain. That cup is something that we cannot ignore if we are to be his followers. In other words, there is in the front of the painting almost as an invitation for us to receive it and sip from it, the very suffering of Jesus Christ. That especially for those who have been abused or their families or anybody associated with the church and the crimes of the clergy. The cup is, is at the edge because it's for us too. And if we are willing to receive it, we shall join him on the path uh, to salvation. The cup is not yet a cup of glory. It is a cup of suffering. There is in this first one too, um, the handprint. Now, who's the handprint? Anybody? A what? The child right? The child. But it's not just the child that has been abused. It's the child within every one of us. Because the story here is not about other people. It's also about the deepest parts of the human condition and the human heart and the ways in which we too ache for the ways in which the salvation of Jesus Christ takes place within us. So over and over and over again, we come back to the beginning here and we too can find our home here.
the image of the hand is not just for our children who have been harmed and who live a life of trauma, but the hand is also for us because the hand is us. And we take our place next to the person who is gonna show us the way through the suffering and then the redemption and all the way home to heaven. So that is the first image here. That's the original. And I, so I wanna go through a couple of these and just um, kind of tease out about how how it happened and what, what, we were, what I was doing and what I was thinking about, okay? Because I think it's really important, again, that the story be told when we look at this because my sisters and brothers, the body of Christ is hurting in all of these issues of abuse and these issues of abuse are also our responsibility. And there's absolutely no question about that. It's our responsibility. The most beautiful thing that I've discovered about the ramifications of the abuse, and I was just at a conference at Notre Dame uh, at the beginning of March, but one of the most beautiful things that I encountered there was that all of the issues of abuse have, are now sh um, shouldered by lay people. Uh, trauma specialists and counselors and lawyers and psychologists and theologians around the country who have taken a responsibility for a lot that has happened in the church. And that is an incredibly powerful thing for us to think about when we're looking at this art and the, and the realization that this art is reflective of a reality that each and every one of us has lived through and still living through and we will still be living through for generations to come. It's really, really important that we understand that we have a place in this too. Because when, the when one piece of the body of Christ is bruised and broken and hurting, it's about the entire body, right? And that's why in this Lenten season, we also have to come to terms with the dying and rising that needs to happen within us so that something new can happen. Let's go to Station 7, which is actually the cover of the book. And it's this image here. So let me ask you guys, what, uh, what are you seeing in this? The eyes. The eyes? So the sinking of water. Yes. Right? Yeah. What else? The sinking in water. What else? She's asking for help because she's sinking. Yeah. Yeah. He's asking for help. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's... Okay. What else do you see? Desperation. Desperation. But the hand is above his face. Mm-hmm. To me, that signifies a sense of hope that 
Mm -hmm. Somebody is there. Yes. So one of us, huh? One of the children. Yeah. One of the children. Yes. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's the beginning of the notion of uh, why, uh, why have you forsaken me? Right, right. Now, it's, yes. 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 Yeah, Jesus bears the cross, right? So the bearing of the cross is incredibly evident in this, right? And I love the fact that you name that as water. Now, here's an interesting piece. I did the same thing with this that I did with the first one and just put paint on there with my hands and whatever. And then sure enough, what emerged first um, were the eyes of Jesus in the center of all that. And so in that position where the eyes emerged, they just emerged. I just said, oh, okay, let's go with it. And then realizing that the cross was there and the chaos around him and the fact that the chaos cannot be wiped away. One of the, th one of the things that we've done with the Stations of the Cross in the first place is so um, whitewashed them, right, and made them pretty and made them non-expressive of what is really going on in the stations in the first place, right? And we're so used to seeing that. We're so used to seeing that. So here is something very different. Now, when I finished all that and I stepped back and I realized that, now, I've been a priest, 30, it'll be 39 years next week. It never occurred to me, ever, that when Jesus took the cross, that it was the beginning of our baptismal life. That it was the drowning, the beginning of the drowning and letting go of what had been so that something new can happen. It never occurred to me that the weight of the cross was the, way, was the ways in which he was literally drowning from the past to look at something new. That never once occurred to me. And then there it was. So you can see how in the doing of art, right, it's about not, um, it's about allowing the art to emerge and, and, and getting out of the way so that something new can happen. That the artist, it, 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 uh, if there is real art, this is a surprise. It's about a new awareness of things and a new interpretation. You know, for those of you who write in a journal or write articles or what, you know, whatever, you know that in the process of writing that you can uncover all kinds of new things that you didn't even know you knew in the writing. It's the same way in visual art. If you can get out of the way and do it and recognize that it's the power of God's love in you, something new can happen. So this was beginning to teach me something. 
Wait till you hear what it taught me. In the end. The hand is there because the children have got to be in this, right? We can't forget the children. However, we also can't forget the child within each one of us because this is our story too. Let's go to um, this third one here, which is uh, 13. Let's go to um, the 13, which is right here. That's the original. There we go. Look at that. It's magic. Isn't it something? It's just magic. So let me ask you in this uh, 13. So there's the image. You've got it in front of you. And there's the original. What are you seeing in this? Another what? A lots of hands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, uh-huh, yeah, it can be any of that, right? The apostles, it can be all of us, it can be anybody. What else are you seeing in it? Surrender. Surrender, yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Anything else? Yes, exactly. Now, and so whose hands is that? Thank you, right? It's all of our hands, exactly, exactly. And notice on his body what he doesn't have. He doesn't have hands. Right? So this was the same way. I started um, in all of that chaos. Um, I started with the face and started doing the body and started realizing that he didn't need hands because um, of all of us here, right? And you could probably use this as a Lenten reflection for the rest of your Lent. If you prayed probably with nothing else during Lent, but realize that you're part of this scene and this is, you are in this, it's probably prayer enough for us, right? Now, here's the interesting thing. I stood back from this when I did it and realized that this was the cross in his heart. Now, you got to trust me on this. I did not paint that. That just was there. There is no cross behind him, right? There's no wooden cross. There's no physical cross. But the cross that he bears and the cross that is ours and the cross that is going to get us somewhere that we call home is here, right? I, I, I didn't paint that. It was just there. I hope you can see in these, in just these three, that 
the reality of art, if it's alive, right? That if it's living, breathing art and not something, guess what, that we want to control, that things are going to be revealed that are just there that God wants us to know, you know? It's a kind of art that um, I never thought in a million years I would be doing this. I just started. But the art has taught me something. Now, let's go back a second. To those two people that I told you about um, when I, Lisa first got me to paint, right? It was, um, and what did I say about them? That they had been abused as children, right? And I had spent hours and hours and hours working with them. And after painting, these stations, um, I also realized that part of my resistance in doing it in the first place, remember I said uh, to John Kyler, I said no to him three times before he finally told me to get over myself. <laughs> but after the whole project was done, and I submitted the project. I, it, these, were, these were supposed to be, these were due in August of 2020, right? I had them done by May 1st of 2020. Why? Because I had lots of time. <laughs> Even when I submitted them to John, I, I did not think liturgical press would, would, would accept them, just because they were um, just so different from what they would normally publish, right? And I also didn't think that the author of the book would appreciate them. Um, and part of my resistance in all of that then so the book was published in, 20, in Christmas of 2020. And, um, and then um, I started, the art started doing some more things with me. And the art um, finally allowed me to realize um, that I had been abused too. I never put that together until doing this art. It was a family friend um, who had been going to summer school at Notre Dame. He was from um, a different city this was uh, Michigan, Indiana, and uh, he, he had befriended my family and me and helped me look at my vocation and help my parents accept the fact that I wanted to be a priest. And then in doing the art, I realized some of the conversations that had been there. I was not attractive enough for him. So he pimped me to another priest in summer school. And I wound up um, in his dorm room uh, 
with him lying on top of me. This is the second priest. I don't even remember what his name was. But thank God um, the phone rang. And he answered it. As I look back on all that, that first priest, um, he, he remained a friend of our families. Um, he vested me when I was ordained nine years later. I just didn't know. I just didn't put it together. And I know that sounds really strange, like how could you not put it together? But it's like every person who experiences these things that you just don't want it to be true. And you just don't think that that's the person um, who has done anything wrong. When the book came out and we, um, last May, um, thanks to Sandy and John, we, I had my very first professional art show uh, at Cottonwood th uh, through the month of May. And uh, we estimated that uh, 900 people saw these originals. And so many folks, uh, uh, at the opening and, um, and, and beyond had told me that they had been abused. So many people. The name of the priest that I was the family friend. And um, you're not going to believe this, but during the, during the art show, at, in fact, it was last Pentecost. John Kyler came down from Minnesota, from Liturgical Press, and we had a talk at, we did a talk at um, Cottonwood. And for the first time, I had said something like, I had known this abuse as myself. That was May 13th last year. So my friend says, he goes, now when was that talk again? And I said, well, it was at Pentecost on May 13th. And he says, he said, you're not going to believe this, but it was that week in May that he, after this priest, after 45 years, was convicted on five counts and was put into prison for eight to 15 years. It was the week that I said that out loud for the very first time, not the month before, not the year before, or 20 years before. It was that month. So look at the grace that happens when we are in tune with the reality of Jesus' life and death and suffering and hope in us coincides with the gifts that God wants us to have. Look what can happen. My sisters and brothers, this is the Lenten journey. This is the way in which all of us realize that we belong to him when we finally can come to the conclusion that everything that is restless and anxious and dark within us can, can be opened up to a realization that our Lord Jesus Christ is here for us and bringing us along into the power of his cross and resurrection. This faith thing is not something abstract. It's not something for pious people only. It's for us who need to find out who we are in the world and ultimately 
who we are with that kind of, with that sense of belonging and hope in our lives. All kinds of things can happen if we believe. There's a lot more I could say about the issues of clergy abuse and our role here as believers to make sure that the generations of our children um, are not only safe, but that we have a responsibility for it and for the healing. People experience trauma, we know that, don't we? I mean, trauma is not just um, sexual abuse. It's, trauma is so widespread in our lives and each and every one of us here has lived a life of that. And we also realize that, that um, we have a responsibility uh, in the church to make sure that um, those who have been abused and traumatized can, can come to a sense of healing. That's, that should be our main mission in the Roman Catholic Church today is to make sure that happens for survivors. And I just want to ask you to think about that and to pray about that as a community as a family, um, your own individual prayer. Because if we don't do something about something that is so interior within the church, we will never have a credible voice again outside, ever. We need to lament we need the wherewithal to listen to survivors and to make sure that their healing is possible. And what I mean by healing is not that we want to control that healing. You know, like, I, I don't expect that the healing of those who have been traumatized by sexual abuse by clergy are ever going to be in the church again. I mean, I don't want to put that end point to it. We just have to make sure that they get the healing, whatever that is, that we can give them, right? It's our duty. And it's our duty because we believe that the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ is invested in our suffering. I can't tell you what a gift this past two years has been for me in light of this art and this understanding. And I'm still trying to unravel the past. Um, I, I'm trying to, and I'm trying to unravel the, the threads that lead me back to that guy and all of the things that he offered me and my family. And I, I struggle with that it, that, it, that it wasn't just all manipulation. But here's how I know it wasn't in the end is because I still believe and I've been a priest for, gosh, almost 40 years. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. The nice thing is, is that last year when I was 65 years old, I realized this and I also realized that God has a lot 
more for me to understand. In some ways, now I feel like I'm just beginning. I'll tell you what, let's, if we have time, let's take our books and let's just pray through these first two stations together. Now, I, I mean, we're not going to have time to do the whole thing. You can do that um, at home. You can come back in the art gallery, um, and it'll be up for a while. You can pray them. You can pray them together. You can grab somebody from the parish and pray these with them. But let's just, I, I, I want us to hear out loud. And um, Sandy, would you mind being uh, the reader part? Just right there. There we go. Come on up. Yeah. So when it comes to the uh, abuse victim survivor's voice, let's just do all, let's do that voice together, okay? As well as the all voice as well at the end, okay? So on page three. Though Jesus Christ was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The first station, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took along Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to feel sorrow and distress. Then he said to them, my soul is sorrowful even to death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He advanced a little and fell prostrate in prayer, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. When he returned to his disciples, he found them asleep. He said to Peter, So you could not keep watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. The spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. When I came to you, I was vulnerable. Let us pray. O oh God, in your son's time of trial, he trusted in his apostles, his chosen religious leaders, but they turned away. We confess the times we have not heard the voice of Jesus, your son, in the cry of those who suffer. Lord Jesus Christ, abused and abandoned, hear the cries of your wounded church. Lengthen us in our trial. We sometimes feel alone in the garden of life, even when shepherds accompany us there. When the weakness of our leaders uncover their disloyalty, let your will be done. Save us from disillusion and despair. The second station. Jesus, betrayed by Judas, is arrested. Then, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs, who had come from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. His betrayer had arranged a signal with them, saying, the man I shall kiss is the one. Arrest him 
and lead him away securely. He came and immediately went over to him and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. At this, they laid hands on him and arrested him. At first, his attention made me feel special, but now I feel dirty and worthless. Let us pray. O oh God, a friend of your son Jesus betrayed him with a sign reserved for love. We confess the times we have confused our desires with true affection. May Almighty God bless and keep us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.